Hey, uh, welcome to the channel. We, we're back after a little hiatus, um, and I'm really excited to be back today with Chris. Chris was on uh, one of the first videos that I did here, and we are back after we tried a couple times to get this going and had to reschedule it a couple times, so we're, it's really good to, to finally make this work. Um, and Chris is, is here. He's got some things that he's uh, planning to just raise that are, I think, of real common interest. And so, um, Chris, I'm going to turn it over to you. Introduce yourself and let's uh, let's jump in. Thank you very much, Rob. My name is uh, Chris. Uh, as we said in the first video, we met through your wife, Amy. Uh, we biked in the summer through the Salem Bike Club. And so we just uh, started talking and then we had lunch and we just kind of enjoy conversations um, of, you know, of theology, religion, even sports. So it's just kind of good to come together and just, you know, have an honest talk of, you know, we see nowadays in society where it's really uh, polarized and kind yeah. of sometimes aggressive. And it's just, you know, just have a talk of, you know, what you believe in, why. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, so, that's, that's great. So I, I feel like today's conversation would be good of just finding out, you know, what you believe and why. And then obviously we'll have, uh, you know, follow up kind of uh, to next time of like what I believe and why. And as people to if anybody who hasn't seen the first video, I am a atheist. Uh, that only says one thing about me that I don't believe in a God. I don't know. I'm agnostic in that aspect. Um, I believe that what really represents me as a person is a secular humanist and a skeptic. And I think that's where I'm kind of searching out what is truth. So, right. Let's, you want, let's go ahead and uh, get started. Okay. So, um, you asked a, a very simple and succinct question, which is what do I, what do I believe? Which, yes. um, <laughs> obviously opens up for, for lots of different things that we can, we can go into. So um, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just kind of summarize it. I did summarize that. I think um, we've had some email correspondence. And so I will, I will give a real brief overview and then um, you follow up with wherever you want to go with it. So um, tr the, the, the Christian worldview is based on uh, an understanding that God created the world um, and when he created it, it was created good, and it was created for a purpose. And when he puts human beings into the world, he puts them in the world also for a purpose, which is to take the raw material of creation and to develop it and cultivate it and um, bring out the full potential of the creation that he has made. Um, but they were to do that as, uh, as image bearers of God, which is a way of saying that... Um, we do it reflecting, well, there's a lot we could say about that, but in, a, in one of the parts of it is that we reflect his, um, his, we sort of bring his authority into the world on his behalf. So we represent his, his, his character and his nature, but we also take the authority that he's given us and then we're meant to work on his behalf in, in the world. Um, but our first parents, uh, instead of doing that properly, they questioned God's authority and chose instead to be ultimately to be a um, we might say a law unto themselves. They decided themselves what right and wrong is. Um, and with that, what that did is that turned the best way I can I, I think compare it is to say that really um, started a um, it, it put creation and it put people at odds with God. And consequently, the world is not as it was intended, and we see the effects of that. Um, everywhere. Relationships are broken. Relationships between people, relationships between people and creation, relationships between people and God. Um, the ultimate answer to that is someone to pay the penalty for disobedience, um, So, because justice has to be done. So um, either we pay the price or someone else pays it in our place, and the Christian message centers on what Jesus has done in coming into the world to pay that price in our place. And then the ultimate, and, and then what that means is that those who um, embrace 
um, Jesus Christ in faith become uh, sort of restored to their original purpose in this world. And they begin to share in doing what God intended us to do from the beginning. And we're working towards a day when finally the world will be made new again and, and will be fully restored. So when we talk about heaven, um, and it's, you know, here's where there are some differences in, in Christianity. But when we talk about heaven, it's not just about, you know, some escape where we all get to go when we die. Um, it's actually the the experience of a completely renewed and transformed creation. So, um, the the Christian message is is based is uh, is based on the revelation of God in the Bible. Um, there's tons we could say about that, but um, the Bible is an expression of who God is and um, how we can know Him, how we can live in relationship with Him, um, and so that that's where our our beliefs and our views are drawn from. But I should also add, um, faith is not at odds with reason. Um, and I, I have to grant that in some cases, especially within the Christian tradition of probably the last 30, 40, 50 years, and even in other periods throughout history, um, the church has been quite opposed to reason in, in different ways. But in many, in many other traditions within the Christian um, tradition, faith and reason are not opposed to each other. <clears throat> they are complementary ways in which we can know and understand um, truth. So that's, that's where, and, and I only bring that up because I know that um, in, you know, in, in certain agnostic and atheistic traditions, that's, that's an understanding of the, the importance of reason and um, how we know and understand is built on reason. And I would, I would just say that the Christian tradition is not, um, it, it's not at odds with, with reason and rationality. It, it um, you know, it, it should be compatible and complementary. So, so anyways, there's, there's it in a nutshell. Um, dig in. So a couple of things um, is why do you believe it? Yeah, that's a good question. That's, that's, um, it's an important one, and I, I would say it's, I think, an important one for, for Christians to wrestle with. Um, in other words, don't just assume something is true because it's been told to you, right? It, and, and people do that. And, and okay, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, um, you know, condemn a person for that. But I think it is true that our, our beliefs have to be examined. And so that's a good question to ask. Why do you believe it? Um, <clears throat> I have... Uh, I spent a lot of time professionally and personally studying um, the Bible and I found it to be um, consistent from beginning to end. Um, I found that it, it, it makes sense. Um, it's, it's a reasonable story. It's not always a pretty one. There's some, you know, especially you go back, there's, there's, yeah, there are parts in the Bible that are really hard to wrap your mind around and, and even parts that you say, how is this in a Bible about, you know, it's supposed to talk about, you know, grace and love. And, and yet there's these stories in there that are just quite frankly, nasty stories. And so, but, but that doesn't mean they're not historically true. Um, it, it also, well, I should throw in here too. Um, well, I'll tell you what, I'll save that. I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, so, so I think that's number one. I think the, the Bible is consistent and I think therefore it is, it is trustworthy. It makes sense. Um, and, and I think logically and philosophically, you start to ask the question, okay, is, is, you know, one of the questions you have to ask is, okay, so did, did Jesus actually exist? Was there really such a person as Jesus Christ? And that's obviously a very central question because if you take Jesus out of the equation, you have nothing left. I mean, you have really nothing of substance left. So you have to ask that question. And I think historically there's, there's extra biblical evidence and, and even most, um, most atheists, most, not all, but most atheists do, do concede that Jesus was a historical person. Um, even Bertrand Russell, you know, he writes about that in his essays. He says, you know, I actually think he was one of the, he was a very, very good person. Um, and many others will concede that, although my, my understanding is like Dawkins does not believe that. I think Dawkins does not believe in the historical Jesus, although I could be wrong about that. Um, I've heard some somewhat conflicting things. But anyways, um, so then if you believe that Jesus is real, then you have to ask the question, OK, so um, what 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 claims did he make 
and he made some pretty uh, outlandish claims, right? He claims to be God, for example. So there's lots of people throughout history that make that claim. Why pay any attention to Jesus over lots of other people in this world that have made the same claim? Why, you know, did he do these miracles? Did, is, there, is there evidence for that? Well, there's, that's a little harder. I mean, that, that, it does take some faith to believe that. Um, but, but if you, you know, if you look at the, at the testimonies concerning who Jesus is and what, what he said about himself, okay, does that, you, you ask the question, was, he was either, and this is a famous um, setup, and you've probably heard it before, he's, and it, because it's, it's C.S. Lewis, he says Jesus is either, he's a lunatic, right, he's someone who, I think in C.S. Lewis's words, has no more sense than a poached egg, right, he, because he's making all these claims and he doesn't, he, he sincerely believes them, he really believes he's God, but everybody else knows, no, there's no way, you know, so he's either a lunatic or he's a liar because he knows that he's not the son of God and he's not divine, but he's still, uh, he's still going around making the claims that he is and he's intentionally misleading people. So he's, he's a liar or a lunatic. Um, C.S. Lewis then says so, or he's Lord. Um, there's one more, I think, possibility, which is, okay, he's just a legend. He's just essentially made up, right? So you, know, so you have to look a, at... There's another option. Which is... He, he never claimed any of those things that he just was a person who was a rabbi who preached about um, helping the Jews get away from Rome and that he just preached about baptism that he never claimed to be God. So the, the I believe that Jesus probably did exist. Mm -hmm. um, that the Romans did crucify him mm -hmm. and that if you read a lot of Roman history, most crucifixions of rome they normally either just left the body to rot mm -hmm. or they took the body and just fed it to the dogs most of the time they left the body because that was a symbol crucifixion wasn't necessarily about the killing but as far as letting people know don't mess with us it was a symbol of sure do not mess with the romans and so to me the belief that oh he was taken down he was put in a burial well, he was considered to be a rebel. And so I believe that C.S. Lewis's claims, um, he's leaving out the fact that the stories could have been made up because um, I, you've studied the Gospels. Mm -hmm. And would you agree that we don't know who wrote them? No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't concede that. Um, in, in some cases, there is some... Uh, there's some scholarly debate, but that's considered heavily in the minority. Um, so no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't concede that. Would you? Would you say that they were written by eyewitness accounts? It depends on which one. I would say that uh, Mark was was written by um, an eyewitness. I would say that uh, Matthew was um, was written by. Um, uh, well, let, let me, I'll say Luke, Luke was written by um, a pretty methodical and meticulous researcher uh, for the time. Uh, John was written, no doubt, by, by the apostle uh, John and, um, you know, Matthew. Um, again, there's, there's maybe some discussion, although I think Matthew was, was written by someone very, at least very close to, uh, to the source. Probably there's, there's a good consensus that both, um, that they that that the gospel writers used other sources certainly mark or um, uh, matthew and luke uh did um there's the the you know the well-known q source which seems to be a yes. reference point and so you know so so in other words I'm, I'm i'm not making the claim that um you know they were necessarily following jesus around like a press corps might follow you know a world leader today but i would i would say that certainly the the research and the and the the accounts are um, are reliable. Well, if if, look, if not firsthand eyewitness accounts in in every case. If you look, Mark was written about they say about seventy C.E. Mm -hmm. uh, Matthew and Luke around ninety, and then John I think about one ten. Would you? No, I don't. I don't know that those dates are accurate. Um, and I'll I'll say this. Pardon me. What would you say the dates would be? Well, I would, I would say that the, the question of the dating of biblical sources has, has always been a real question of scholarly discussion, right? In other words, um, 
most of the writers don't date their materials the way that we would today if you know you write a document you put a date on it right so okay that wasn't typically done i would put john uh, considerably earlier i would put john around uh uh, probably 90s or some point around then, I would put um, Mark probably a generation or so after um, after Jesus' um, resurrection. Um, Matthew and Luke probably came a little later than that. Uh, John, John, in all likelihood, and his gospel and his um, letters were um, scholarly sources agree that they were probably written while John was in exile on um, an island. And that would have been, so if, if we, if, if we take the assumption and I, you know, again, here, there's maybe some, some debate um, and you, you may not uh, agree with this, but there's the theory that John was again, a disciple of Jesus. And so that puts him in the lifetime of, of Jesus. So we would say, uh, let, let's even grant for the sake of discussion that he's younger than Jesus. So He's maybe born in 20 um, CE, um, maybe 15 CE. Uh, if he lives a long life, which is kind of assumed, then he's you know getting into the 80s, 90s, and that's about when he would have written his um, um, his his letters. Now, you know, the debate there's there's some room for there's some wiggle room on that, right? Because again, the dates are not necessarily hard and fast, and just about every book in the Bible has some scholarly debate in terms of, well, when was this written? And there's, you know, competing theories for that. Um, so. So, and, and there's a lot of debates on when they're written, if they were written by eyewitness accounts, you know? And so my main concern really is what evidence do we have to show that this is really true? You know what I mean? That's yeah. the thing as, Atheist, you know, would you agree that a uh, Muslim and a Hindu hold as much faith to their belief as you do? I'm sure they do. Sure. As, so, you know, and, and we could add a number of, of other traditions in that as well, right? Mormonism, uh, Mormons place a lot of stock in the Book of Mormon. Jehovah's absolutely. Witnesses put their... Uh, their faith in their interpretation of of the Bible, right? So, of course, every and I would assume that most adherents hold pretty tightly to uh, to the views of their faith tradition. I, I think that's that makes sense. Would you agree um, or disagree that you can't have both Hinduism and Christianity both being true at the same time? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would, I would, right, I would, I would agree, right? In other words, and I would, I would throw numerous religions into that category, right? Because they all make competing claims. So how can they all be true, right? So yeah, of course, that that's, they, they are, um, they are, they are contradictory worldviews. And so they can't all be true. Um, so if, if I'm wrong, and they're right, or uh, let me say it this way, if they're right, they being whoever, right, Buddhist, Muslim, Hindu, Mormon, Jehovah's Witness, whatever, then I'm wrong, right? So yeah, that, that makes sense. Now, that's on, and I would, I would just qualify that by saying that has to do with the central claim of the religion. In other words, lots of religions say, you know, murder is not a good idea. Well, okay, those are not contradictory things. But in the essential claims, um, yes, there, you know, when, when there's contradiction, of course, we can't all be right. Okay. So how... So how do we resolve that contradiction? Yeah. 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 That's again, that is, that is a central, uh, that is a central question that has to be asked. You have, and, and, and I would say this is where I think there is that overlap of, there's a certain amount of rationality that has to go into asking this question. There's also a measure of faith, and, and by faith, I don't mean faith as opposed to reason, but I mean faith that comes, that, that, that means you're finally going to put your trust in, in some conclusions that you make, right? In other words, sometimes Christians, and, and I'll, I'll, before I answer the question, and I will answer it, I promise, or at least I'll answer it as best as I can, but I'll, 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 I'll throw this out there first, because I think it's worth uh, noting. Sometimes Christians talk about proving that God exists or proving that the Bible is true. And 
I think that's a I think that's a misleading way of talking because proof suggests something that is um, a truth beyond any sort of question or uncertainty, right? In other words, mathematical proofs. I think it's better to talk in Christian in in terms of making sense of a worldview. I think it's better to talk in terms of giving sort of building a case and and making a reasonable and sort of putting together reasonable evidence and then drawing conclusions um almost the way that you would in a courtroom okay. a courtroom right never prove you know the idea is not you sort of present evidence either you know the standard of evidence is preponderance of the evidence or beyond a reasonable doubt but but in a sense you're never actually proving anything right so with that qualification I would say, um, so how do you know that the, how, how do you, how do you know that, that the Bible is true over the others? Well, I would say, again, we're going to look at some of the evidence. We're going to look historically, um, are there, can, can, can the, uh, can the stories of the Bible, can they be corroborated by external evidence? Um, and much of it can be, not all of it. And by that, I mean, there's, there's blank spots, right? There's spots where, okay, we've got records of certain kings and rulers, but well, they were maybe only a minor figure. And so no, there's really no historical or uh, yeah, historical uh, ex extra biblical historical evidence for that. But there are a lot of actually a surprising number of things that are consistent with um, uh, historical facts and evidence. So, um, and, you know, I have to say, I'm not an expert on this, so it's, it's hard for me to point to all kinds of examples, although I could probably point to a number of them. But, but there is, you know, so that's one of them. The other thing is you look for consistency, right? In other words, the Bible is written over a span of centuries, even millennia. Um, now, however you, you interpret that, um, you know, sources are gathered together and, and some people might say, well, you know, you just had people sort of writing things down that they thought were inspirational or, you know, their, their own messages. So even if you concede that, even if you concede that it wasn't inspired by, as Christians say, inspired by the Holy Spirit, you just say it was just sort of a factual document written. So mm -hmm. even if for the, for the moment I concede that, you still have to realize that you're talking about a book that's compiled over, over millennia and it's remarkably consistent, right? So in other words, you've got things that are being said uh, hundreds of years before Jesus even exists. And then when, and, and, and they're said about something that it, when they were, when these things were originally written, these we, you know, prophecies, but I, I sort of don't like that term, but for the sake of discussion, prophecies that are made about Jesus. And then lo and behold, they all kind of come true. And, and these are not things that were written, but, you know, again, prophecies that were written over the span of hundreds of years, and they all are fulfilled in, in one person. Um, you know, so, so that's, that's something that has to be taken into account. How do you, how do you get all these things that were written in advance and they all are, are coming true in one person? Um, the other thing then you start to look at is manuscript evidence. So, and this is, this is a really detailed science, right? So, um, in other words, some, some traditions are, are, are sort of based on documentary evidence that is sort of presented as you just have to trust us that, that, this, is, that this was written down. Christianity says there are hundreds and hundreds of copies of manuscripts. Now, of course, we don't have the original originals, right? We don't have yeah. the paper where Matthew or Mark or Luke or whoever else wrote it down. But we've got copies that are about second generation, which in, you know, in documentary evidence language, that's pretty good. That's considered pretty reliable, especially when you start comparing the manuscripts um, with each other. In other words, you look at the manuscripts that were found in Egypt and you compare those with manuscripts that were found in, um, you know, um, um, parts of, of Asia or in Greece. And and you start putting them side by side, and it's remarkable how similar they actually are. Um, there are um, what are there are textual variants, um, but in terms of uh, in terms of reliability, the textual variants are are incredibly minor. Not there's a couple of exceptions to that, and again, there's a bunch of scholarly 
um, discussion on what, what do you make of that and how do you deal with that. But for a book, as, for, for the copies that we have and for the number of manuscripts that we have, you know, it's, it's, it's remarkable how similar they are. So then you have to ask the question, well, why, how, do, why is that? Why do we have um, so many copies that are so consistent? How did it stay consistent? You would expect maybe more variance over time, but you don't get that. Um, you get quite remarkable consistency. So then that, that, you know, so the, and that's again, just a summary, but then you say, okay, if that's the case, then we have to at least take seriously the story of what the Bible is all about. What, what is, what is the message of the Bible? Is it whether or not I like it, whether or not, you know, it appeals to me, you have to at least ask the question, is it possible that this is true? And, and then you go from there. So a couple questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. And I talked for a long time. So, um, so, so just because something is old, does it make it true? Well, no, it doesn't, that doesn't automatically make it true, okay. Okay. but it, it, it says, okay, you're, you're going to not, not just because it's old, but because it's consistent and because of the, of the, um, you know, the care that was taken to preserve it, you at least say, okay, you, you should at least take seriously the claims that are being made. So because something has history, does that make it that the other things that are not history, supernatural, are those two? Let me give you an example. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm writing a paper, and you're looking at the paper, mm -hmm. and I say 2 plus 2 equals 4. Mm -hmm. That is true, right? Mm -hmm. So if I make the claim that I'm Batman, does that mean <laughs> that part is true? I don't know, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Am I Batman? So, you know. Well, right. Okay. So you, you, you see kind of right. the point that I'm taking is of course. these people wrote, they were, obviously it was written by humans. So would I expect things to be somewhat true in some of their aspects of the, of the world around them? Yeah, most likely. Now, some of the history, um, I don't think we can go, I've done some studies and I think that archaeology can go back to about King David, but I don't know if they can really determine, uh, like, the, you know, the Noah story, Adam and Eve, you know, that kind of, so some of that older stuff don't really see. And so my thing is, f for you, um, is we don't know if it's true. We know the world around us. And we've seen science showing things. So why wouldn't we believe what we know and what we're seeing of science versus a book? So, for example, uh, there's 38% in a poll. I don't know if it's true today, but in 2014, there was a poll. And they come up with about 38% of people still believe in young earth creationists, mm -hmm. creationism. 38%. Is that total population or of professing Christians? In, in the U.S. Okay. Population in the U.S. And then 38% believed in evolution through God, um, you know, intervention. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting that people are putting their faith in a book that was written by people that didn't even know that the earth rotated right. around the sun. Right. So why would we put stock on this when we have evidence today to show yeah. that because for example science scientists i don't know many scientists that says you know what the theory of evolution the theory you know big bang theory these are good theories but we had to have a god now, i don't yeah. see a scientist saying well a god had to be there we are we are showing that this world naturally could have been here and so, so now my stock of christianity is Yes, you look at it and you say, look what's reasonable. And one point that I wanted to ask you is, when you said you studied Christianity to see you know, if it was reasonable, but were you already a Christian when you studied it? Sure. So, so yes. I, you, you see that where, like, I, I am a Muslim and I study Muslim to see if it, you know, right. Islam to see if it's true. You see that there's a sort of bias in there. There's not sort of a bias. There is a bias. Of, of course there is. And, and I would say, well, um, atheists have their bias too, right? So if you come at Christianity, you, you likely come at it 
with a bias against it. It doesn't mean we can't change our perspectives, right? And so, yeah, you're right. I mean, I come at it with a bias. I've been raised in and around the church. And so it's, it's called confirmation bias. We tend to seek out the evidence that reinforces our position. Um, oh. And I would say it's probably impossible for anyone to be 100% um, objection uh, or uh, uh, objective in a, in a case like this. So that's true. I mean, I, I concede that. So what kind of bias do you think? An eight, so sometimes it depends on the atheist. Some of them came from a Christian background mm -hmm. or a religious background. So they understand. And so with the atheist viewpoint is I don't, and again, every atheist is different. So I can't speak for everyone. Right. But for me, and there's a portion that I have similar where we want evidence. We're not just mm -hmm. going to take something based off what you say or say this is more reasonable when we have um i did a google search there's i don't know how correct google is 4200 different religions so mm -hmm. if you look at christianity and we're not talking about the other denominations of christianity but just christianity that's one out of 4200 mm -hmm. that doesn't make christianity any special than any so, of the other religions so, they're all seeming some type of god so let me be a smart aleck for a minute, just to, to make a point, okay? So okay. what evidence do you have that your Google search there is accurate? You're right. What, <laughs> but, what, you know, here's the thing. On it, here's the thing. I could go to Google, and there's probably sources. There's probably a list of different religions, and I could sure. count them all. So I could do more research, and so I could show evidence to show all these religions, right? Sure. So I can go through and I can count them, I can write them down, and I would have a bunch of papers, and I could count them out, and I could probably come up with a pretty good number, right? With, yeah, sure. So, the, right, the reason, have, the re, so, so that, the reason I ask is, is, you know, in some ways just to be a smart aleck, but in other ways it's, it's, it's to make the point again that I think, Again, what I'm suggesting is you do the same thing with, with Christianity. People shouldn't just accept blindly the claims of, of the Bible or of Christianity. You should do the investigative work. I, I want to come back to, to, to sort of maybe unpack that or, or revisit um, an aspect of that, to, to come back to the story of, of creation, because I think that's an important one. Um, obviously, wherever you stand on the issue of creation, you're drawing assumptions from uh, from evidence, right? You're, but but the evidence is not conclusive either way because nobody was there. So we have hypotheses and we have theories, and whether you're, um, you know, whether you're someone that believes the Earth is, you know, trillions of years old or whether it's a few thousand years old, you're drawing that based on some evidence. Now, I'll I'll tip my hand a little bit. I happen to believe that the Earth is very plausibly millions billions or trillions of years old i don't i don't think that's a claim that's at odds with christianity or with the bible now i know that i'm you know i know that there are others within christian circles that would disagree with that i know that there are scientists who would agree with that claim that the bible is you know or that the earth is you know six thousand years old and they'll present scientific evidence that's a little outside of my expertise but here's here's the point that i want to make what really is what really matters most when you read the Bible, or I shouldn't say most, but one of the things that really matters when you read the Bible is that you're reading it in a way that it was meant to be read. Genesis 1 was not meant to be read as a scientific textbook. It was not meant to be read as a scientific explanation for the origins of the universe. So that's why I think it's, it's risky to make that say something about the age of the earth. I would rather read it as, as an account of, number one, who is, what is, what is the origin, or more accurately, the Christian would say, who is the origin, and then you read it as a polemic against so many of the other ancient gods of, of the time, the Ugaritic gods, and the Babylonian gods, and the Chaldean, the Egyptian gods, and so on. The message there is, okay, all these other gods worship, uh, or all of these other uh, nations worship you know, the sun, or they worship the ocean, or they worship the water, and Christians, it wasn't Christians, it would be the Jewish people are worshiping the God who created all of those things. That's how I think the book of Genesis was meant to be, or I should, Genesis 1 and 2 were meant to be read. I think Christians especially, and this is, by the way, this is a new thing, because within the last century, maybe century and a half, is, is when, um, 
the evangelical fundamental strain of Christianity has put more evidence into trying to um, read the, the Genesis 1 and 2 account in a very literal fashion. Um, that comes out of, you know, the Scopes trial of the 1920s. That's a new development. Um, for a long time, if you go back a few hundred years, you read lots of biblical scholars who were much more willing to say, hmm, we don't know how old the earth is, but that's not really the main point. Yeah. Um, so, it, and, and again, to, to, to the bigger point is, when we look at the claims of the Bible, we have to be sure we're understanding what the Bible is saying and what it's not saying as a way of evaluating the evidence, right? So if you say, oh. if you say I'm, I'm Batman, um, okay, so I, I, you, you make that, you write that claim in a paper. Well, then it's my job not just to say, well, he's actually making the claim that he's the Cape Crusader living in Gotham City, but to say, okay, is he meaning this as a figure of speech? Is he meaning it as a, you know, okay, what does he actually mean? And then you go and you start to investigate. So if I were really serious about that, I would say, okay, well, uh, do we have some kind of evidence that uh, these, these um, heroic antics are being performed under cover of darkness by someone that's, you know, <laughs> sort of a mask? And then, okay, well, I didn't see Chris last night when this alleged rescue took place. So maybe he is. So in other words, you know, we're being cheeky here, but the point is you, 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 you don't just dismiss the claim out of hand. You actually investigate it a little bit and you actually try to do some of the, the work to corroborate it. And then you ask the question, um, is it compatible? And, and, and I would say, by the way, there, one of the big drivers behind science and for that matter, literature and art, um, you know, five, especially five, 600 years ago was the Christian, uh, the Christian worldview, especially behind science, because it said, um, the, the idea was science is a way of understanding and making sense of the world that God has made. And so it, it wasn't about, um, you know, reject science because it might contradict the Bible, although that took place in the more institutionalized Roman Catholic Church. Science was about saying, let's, uh, let's investigate. Let's, because the more we know about the world, the more we can see about who God is. Um, and Christians historically call that general revelation, where we say, actually, science can teach us about the nature of God. You know, he's a God of order, and he's a God of structure and design and purpose and so on and so forth. So um, there are lots of scientists, you know, Watson, uh, I think it was Watson, the, the guy behind that helped to un, un, or decode the, the human genome, became a Christian through his study of DNA and science. And it, and it was, you know, now he's, you know, he's a, a Christian who believes that the earth is millions of years old, but, but nevertheless, he became a Christian through um, his study of science. And I also believe that you can have somebody that holds beliefs that could be different. You could believe in one thing and it be true and believe in something else and not be true. So yes, I understand that. The, and you know, Gino, but his faith in Christianity doesn't mean that because one is true, the other is true. Um, so, but I did want to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. What I would assume that you believe in a heaven. Mm -hmm. You believe in a hell. Mm -hmm. As far as, um, I'm not sure a lot of the Christian Reformed Church, how they believe on what is required to be saved. Who, who makes it to heaven, in, <laughs> in your view? Yeah. So um, let me preface my answer again, because, uh, because obviously that's a question that people find troubling. Not so much the heaven part, because actually, um, you know, polls show that the majority of people believe in some form of heaven or some form of afterlife. Um, and I've, you know, again, I've seen this too, especially in, you know, you minister to a family who's lost a loved one and, or you, you know, you read through the obituaries, for example, um, and a person who, you know, and I want to be careful about this. I don't mean in any insens insensitivity on this. I just mean, we often don't think so much about heaven until either we're facing our own mortality or we're facing the death of a loved one, then all of a sudden we want to, you know, we, we don't like the idea that, well, okay, they died and now they're in the ground, period. Um, Bertrand Russell writes about that in his, in his essays. He says, you know, um, he, he says something like this. He says, I know that when I die, I'm just going to rot and they're going to put me in the ground. And I'm like, okay, that's fine for, for Bertrand Russell to say that, but most people have a hard time um, acknowledging that, I think. So we like the idea, whether we're Christian or not, we like the idea that there's a heaven. Very few people are really excited about the idea of hell. 
I would just say this. Um, if we can conceive of hell as a place where, well, let, let me put it this way. Suppose the afterlife is, um, is, a, is a continuation of the things that you desired pursue in this life. In other words, if you spend your whole life wanting nothing to do with God, then wouldn't it make sense that for eternity, then you don't have to deal with God anymore. So what if, in other words, what if we, instead of thinking about hell as this place of, uh, you know, sort of people rubbing their hands with glee because people are, other people are getting what's finally coming to them. And I don't think Christians should see hell in that way. I think we just see it rather as, okay, if you want nothing to do with, with God for your whole life, mm -hmm. then in the end, it, you know, God finally says, okay, um, if that's what you, of desired, then that's what you receive. So then in that sense, hell is not people being pushed somewhere against their will. Um, it's, it's about people receiving what they sought after for their entire earthly life. Now, the question of, as to who gets in, well, that's the irony of it, because it's not the good people that get in, and it's not the bad people that stay out. It's those who admit that they have no rightful claim to get in and look only to, to in the Christian gospel, say you look only to Jesus and say, the only hope I have of getting in is, is in him. Those are the ones that get in. So in other words, it's not it. We, we cut the pie in half by saying, okay, good people this way, good people on the top, bad people on the bottom. If you live a good and virtuous life, if you try hard to follow the 10 commandments, or if you try hard to follow the golden rule, or if you try hard to, you know, be a decent person, um, then in the end, you're sort of found worthy of, of heaven. But I think that's the wrong way of cutting it, because I think, I think you, you cut, you've got to conceive of cutting the pie completely opposite of that, which is to say, um, it's, it's, it determines what your relationship with, with Jesus determines whether or not you, you are in. Um, do, you, do you look to him as, as the only means that makes you worthy of acceptance? And if you do, then you're in. And that means, what that means is that you get the quote unquote good people who, you know, are decent people. They work hard and, but, but they're not saying, look at how good of a life I live. They're saying, whatever good I have is not for myself. It's comes from my relationship with Jesus. It also means that the really, really bad people get in. Um, you know, people who have committed horrendous crimes and atrocities and they realize and, and acknowledge that and say, boy, I am not worthy or deserving at all. But in Christ, I find forgiveness and I'm, I'm made new. So in that sense, the, the, the gospel is about good and bad people getting in, but not on the basis of their goodness or their badness, just on the basis of their relationship with Jesus. So what about the Hindu that doesn't believe in Jesus? They believe well, in God. So are they going to hell? And based off what you just said, it sounds like, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that they would go to hell because they don't believe in Jesus. The and it's Christian, not that they don't want to. Here's the thing. Yeah, and I, this yeah. is the argument I'm going to raise. It's not that I don't want to believe in him. It's that yeah. I don't believe that there's evidence to support the claims that Christians are making. If he is real, I would love for him to come right now, sit by me, and let's have a chat. Mm -hmm. And that's right. the thing, is to say, well, you know what? He has shown you proof. You're just denying it. So you yeah, are going yeah, to live yeah. with your, and I'm just like, no, I don't agree with that. That is not fair to claim that the only people getting in are Christians. And here's the thing, what, like, before, so we don't get into like the no true Scotsman fallacy, but what Christians, I mean, <clears throat> are Mormons getting in? Let's say, for example, let's set aside, Book Mormon, let's say that Joseph Smith didn't do it. Okay. Mm-hmm. And they're following somebody, but they still believe in Jesus. Although, yes, they believe that he's the son of, or the son of God, literally, and that he's the brother of Lucifer, and that some of their teachings are different. But they still believe in Jesus. They mm -hmm. still believe in Heavenly Father. Are they getting in? Yeah, those are really, you know, those are tough questions all the way around. Whether you're talking about, you know, the the proverbial. Uh, tribe in Africa that has never heard the gospel or whether you're talking about, you know, your neighbor next door. Um, 
and I, you know, I, I think, I think Christians have to be very careful and, and humble in how they answer that. Um, because I don't, I don't want to come across as sort of in, in any way with my nose in the air about, Oh, I'm in and you know, a few dummies are all out. Cause that's not the way I, I look at it. Right. I, I, at least in the sense of the only reason that I'm in is, is, you know, even the knowledge and the understanding that I have. And, and I say even faith that I have is not because somehow I've done something in and of myself. It's, you know, Christianity historically maintains that even faith is something that is given to you when you ask for it. So, so I, th what that means is that, that you have to be incredibly humble. I mean, I would just say that to all Christians. I also think there's this, I also think there's a sense in which we have to say, um, God, at the end of the day, God is the one to sort it all out. And God is far better equipped than I am to make the call about, well, what about the person who, you know, you know, they, they believed in God. They didn't really have a clear understanding of who Jesus was. Historically, the Christian faith says you, you know, it's faith in Jesus that, that gets you in. Um, but for some of the more difficult ones, I am perfectly willing to say, I'll let God, I'll, uh, my job is to um, explain as best as I can what I understand the gospel to be. I'll let God worry about everything beyond that in term, including whether a person begins to understand and make sense of what the Christian faith is all about, whether they believe it or reject it, what happens at the end. I'm perfectly content to let God be the one to sort that all out. But you see the irony of that is believe in Jesus to get in, but you have the Hindu and the Muslim that are very adamant about their gods and their beliefs. Mm -hmm. They don't believe Jesus is the son of God, or they believe maybe he was a prophet or they believe other things. But to say that you have an all powerful deity that wants people to get to heaven. Right. So that's the goal to mm -hmm. be with God. Right. Do you agree that that would be his ultimate goal to be with God? If, the, if there is a God, his goal is to get there. So wouldn't he do everything possible? If there is only one true religion, one true denomination, wouldn't it be his goal to try to make sure that people understand what that is? That's the problem is I'm sitting here mm -hmm. and you're telling me, look, this is the right one. And I'm looking and I'm saying, mm -hmm. where in the world are you coming up with that? Right. You're like, just read it. It's, it makes sense. <laughs> it's the right one. And I'm looking right. at you like, I, I disagree. Yeah. And that's sure. the problem that we have. And, you know, in your, in your worldview, I would probably go to hell. I don't believe in hell. So I'm not right. worried about it. But, but to me, that, see, here's the thing. If there, let's say there is a heaven and hell. I would be really sad. The fact that I go to hell without a God, knowing that it wasn't that I just, just disbelieved because I wanted to. It's because I'm using the brain and I'm using what God gave me and created me for to rationalize. Because if there's only one true religion, how am I supposed to use my brain and determine which is the right one without evidence and reason? And so that's, that's the ultimate. But, but in part, I mean, look in part, that's, that's, that's the fun of a conversation like this right now. We're, we're just engaging worldviews. We're, we're not, I'm, I'm not even necessarily trying to convince you that I'm right and you're wrong. We're just, we're sort of engaging, but, but out of that comes this um, grappling with, you know, how do we understand? How do we make sense of it? Um, so I, you know, I, I, yeah, anyways, I, I think, I think it is a good question worth asking. And I sense the, the, the dilemma that there is around it. And I mean, in some ways, you could argue that it does seem unfair. But supposing, just, just again, if you take for the sake of argument the belief that there is a God okay. who is who's all-powerful, wouldn't it also stand to reason? Now, I, I want to emphasize hypothetically here, because what I'm about to say is going to be a little, uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether or not 
he's really, really nice or really, really harsh. It doesn't really matter so much whether we like it or not. Right. In, in other words, because, because what matters is, is it reality? Is it, is it true? You're absolutely right. But it does matter because if God does whatever he wants and he's evil, well, that's like saying, you know, God is like uh, North Korea. Do I want to go to a North Korea sure. heaven? Sure. Absolutely no. <laughs> like if God says, you know, this is my way or the highway, I'm going to kick sure. you out. Wouldn't you really want to be there? And so here's what I'm talking about using common sense and the world around us. I know that in general, Christians believe that um, people in same-sex couples, um, that is a sin. And I would, and I've read on, you know, for CS, for Christian Reformed Church, that they kind of agree that it is a sin mm -hmm. due to original sin. Here's my concern. If we look at the world around us, God created everything, correct? Um, yes. I, I hesitate only because it depends on what you mean by created Great, everything. Like but animals. Yeah. So God created the animals. Uh, correct. Yes. Okay. So... If same-sex couple is a human and it has to do with sin, tell me why there's animals that are into same-sex actions. Do you know that 8% of sheep prefer same-sex arrangements even when there's fertile sheep around? So if sheep have no soul and they have no, like the devil, I mean, the devil's not trying to trick sheep. Sheep are not going to heaven. Why would sheep perform same sex and to say, well, in humans, it's a sin, but the rest of the animals, yeah. they perform it. I mean, we see the nature. So when I'm looking at nature and I'm seeing these animals and, you know, back in the day, their sheep engaged in this, but then we say, oh, it's a sin because God doesn't like it. But there well, are why also, would sheep? why would he create sheep that engage in same sex? Well, why would he create um, animals that eat their mate after they, mate right I mean, they eat the, the wife the the female eats the eats her partner after they've copulated so why would he do that right that, in other words arguing from the animal kingdom i'm not sure is always the best way to do it and, and I, i'm being a i'm being a smart aleck on that a little bit again but but, but no, my no, bigger no. my bigger point is that when you if if you're going to compare the animal kingdom to human beings you're really equating two things that i don't think you can necessarily so equate. it's so it's okay for the animal kingdom to to engage in same sex and god's okay with it but humans it's wrong do you see yeah. more common and and sense of reasoning makes you think that it, really but it, yeah but i think that's flawed reasoning because i think how's that um, flawed? because how's that flawed? Because I think you're making a, a, an irrational comparison. If if sex, look, you know, um, how many look look at different species, and you know, they mate around like crazy. I mean, dogs will hump any dogs that they meet in the park. Is that then stand to reason that hey, human beings can do the same thing? Why not just you know, everybody's and and they do. And we we you know, my point is my point is for. In, in the Christian understanding, sex between two people means something very, very different than the simple act of copulation in the animal kingdom. Okay. And so, uh, now, look, I, I would, we're at the point where um, we almost got to wrap this up and we're getting into such a huge topic that I would love to come back and do a whole video on just that topic. And I think we could fill the hour easily on that. Um, I'll just, I'll tell you what, let me, let me just conclude this with this. And if we want to come back, we'll do a video on that whole topic on its own. I would just say that in the Christian worldview, sex is meant to mean something a lot more than it does in the animal kingdom. And it's, you know, historically Christians have understood that marriage and sex are meant to reflect the nature and the image of God in partnership with his, in, in his covenant with his church. So um, so, so that's why sex is held in a different, uh, in a different light, um, so certainly God, than the animal kingdom. So God created animals and they can do it, but in, in humans, it's wrong. So here's do the animals thing. have a soul. Well, I don't know. I, here's the thing. My dog, I feel is 
a lot better than maybe some humans, you know, does he steal from people? Well, he steals food, but uh, you know, <laughs> did I say that my dog is a really good dog and the way that he cares and he loves and you know, yeah, I would say he's really good. Maybe he deserves to go to heaven, you know, too. So here's the thing, God, if God is all powerful, then he could have created animals that didn't engage in this. But the fact of the matter is animals do engage in this. So it tells me, okay, so let me, tr and I look at this through the lens of biology and evolution and saying, okay, so it's wrong here, but it's right here. That doesn't make sense because I feel like we, we are evolved from a lesser form of primates and we have a common ancestor, you know, millions of years ago. So to me, it is natural. And a God, if a God says it's not, if, if a God says it's not right, we have a choice. The animals don't, but the animals engage in it. Doesn't that mean that maybe God created it in animals? How far are you willing to take that line of argumentation? I mean, seriously, like if you want to say, well, look, we can do as the animals do. How far, where are you going to draw your line? Well, I mean, I'm assuming you've got some place where you're going to say, well, I'm not going to go that far. Well, I absolutely, you know. And, and where I, is it? Where, where's the line? I think the line has to do with just trying to show that we need to observe the world around us and say, it's not right here, but God created everything. And so I'm using that as an example of if God created everything and uh, same-sex couples was not created by God and it's a sin and it was derived from the devil, but then you have animals doing it, that to me, I hopefully that people start to question that, you know, and that not just, hey, then it opens up to anything you want. No, I'm trying to use that as to say that really, I, you know, to start using common sense and not a book. And here's the thing, that's the thing, using science and common sense of what we know of the world today versus thousands and thousands and thousands yeah. of years ago. Well, that's- and Here's yeah. the thing, here's the thing, Rob, would you agree in the book of the Bible, is this to, if a man lies with another man, then you know he should be surely put to death. But I would assume that you don't go around killing people of same sex. Couple, not usually, right? not usually. But in no. the Bible, it says to do so. So why don't you do that? Um, so I just finished teaching a, or I will finish teaching a four-month class on that exact topic. Um, it's took me four months. You can't expect me to cram in an answer in okay. the last okay. minute here. We will cut. Let's do a video about that sometime because that deserves a whole topic on its own. Um, we're in over an hour now, so. Okay. Um, I'm going to give I'm going to give you a chance to to wrap up and then I'll just um, conclude a couple of things. Those are really excellent questions. I, I'm not trying to be dismissive. I'm just truly really trying to say if we want to go into that, it's going to take us um, it's going to take us a lot more time to do justice to that. Um, <laughs> but it's 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 a topic I'd love to to delve into at some point. So uh, go ahead, finish last word. Go ahead, take it. Well, thank you, Rob. I mean, it's been a pleasure. I appreciate our talks. And our discussions and I feel like from it that I've I learn and I you know and just people being able to engage of like what you believe and why and that's what I want people to look at is what you believe and why and is it because you believe it because you were raised as it or do you find it and that's the problem is that when people are raised in something mm -hmm. most people will still follow it mm -hmm. I, I talk to um, you know, Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses and other Christians. And it's very interesting that it's very circular. Well, how do you know it's true? Well, because I had to find it on my own, but you were raised in it and it led them back to what they believe. And it's very interesting that they say, well, you, everybody has to find their own truth, but it led them back to what they were raised at. Right. And that's my, my main concern is that are you when you're raising something and you're looking for something, are you looking for truth to support mm -hmm. what you already believe? Or are you looking for truth of setting aside all of that and looking at it? And yeah. I, I appreciate this conversation, what you believe and why, you know, I have a lot of respect for you. I feel like you come at things, um, try to be non judgmental, <laughs> and, you know, understanding that it's some, these are some tough topics 
And these yeah. are some things that people can be angry at sometimes. Yep. And yep. it's and it's not meant to be. Right, right, right. No, <laughs> I, you know what? Ab- absolutely. And and I will say, Chris, I, I appreciate very much your spirit of humility. You're asking good questions and challenging me. Um, you know, we do live in an age where people just become entrenched. And, and I think we always have to be on guard against that. And so these, these conversations are really helpful to me as well. So I, I do really appreciate um, us having the chance to do this. And um, I'm going to put, um, I'm going to put a link in the video to our other video. Um, the, the one that we did, it's been a couple months now, I think, since we did that one, because I think we did it in August. So I'll put a link there so you can watch the first conversation with Chris. Um, I'm also going to put a link if, uh, to a form. If you are interested in having a video conversation with me, like the one you've just seen, um, click on the link, fill it out, and we'll set up a time to do a chat. Um, we'll talk about really anything under the sun as it pertains to worldview, faith, spirituality, religion, non-religion, atheism, theism, agnosticism, and the long list is uh, almost endless. So fill out the form if you want to have a conversation. Um, Chris, thank you again. This was a pleasure. It was a great chat, and we will follow it up sometime soon with, uh, yeah, with kind of a second discussion and uh, on some of the things that you've heard. So again, thank you, and thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.